I will defeat the Powerpuff Girls, or my name isn't Mojo Projo. Grumgully vs. Pramacon, Volo, and the Scarab Guard. And we've got plenty of mana there. Not a lot of ramp, not a lot of creatures either. I mean, it's not terrible, but it's not good either. I'll risk a free mulligan. Uh, okay, that's not great either, but we'll just have to hope that we can go slow. Tribute to the World Tree into our commander, and then maybe we'll get some other stuff along the way. We'll just try this. Okay, some ramp on turn two for each of our opponents, which is what we wanted to get into. Ornithopter for Volo, Talisman for the Jeskai player. And we just draw into another land. Ravager Worm was on the previous turn, so take advantage and get out another tap land here. The first commander is Volo, Guard to Monsters. And the first wall over here for Pramicon, that is Wall of Frost. Alright, and another land in Command Tower for us, so get that down so that we've got triple green for Tribute to the World Tree. Obviously this deck cares about plus counters and stuff, so this will cantrip on the big stuff and put plus counters on the small stuff. And I need to give credit where it's due actually. I wasn't going to bother with this commander. The problem is, with this channel now, is um, the viewers only care about, for the most part, I'm painting with broad brushstrokes here of course, but the numbers don't lie. The viewers for the most part only care about the newest commanders and the newest sets within... I don't know, a fortnight, uh, two or three weeks maybe, of the set's initial release, and then after that the interest just dies off. The problem being that most people also aren't all that interested in older commanders either, so it's kind of just you get this spike in popularity for a few weeks when a set releases, and then the interest just completely dies off after that, you know. But it was suggested in the Discord, and I'm just looking in the Discord now so I can see who said it, a uh, peculiar flame in the Discord suggested that we could maybe do a um, Christmas-esque style um, of video. And he did suggest Grum Gully. And I remember back in the day, I did struggle with Grum Gully. I referred to that deck as being cursed. Because I just couldn't draw into the card drawer and the whatever it was. I can't remember how the games went now. But did struggle with this commander back in the day. And don't really mind revisiting it. It is a commander that I think is quite interesting. So it's a Christmas Grum Gully episode, and uh, do thank Peculiar Flame for suggesting that one. But my point being that this is an older commander, and um, yeah, according to a lot of the viewers, you want to see older commanders more than the newer stuff sometimes, so we'll test that theory with this video. Volo has now got down a Panharmonicon, so yeah, getting into everything he needs here. Lich Lord of Unks for the Scarab God player previously as well. And we see our first Planeswalker of the game, Tao the Shield Mage, is going to make walls. Didn't tick down, curiously, to make the wall, so just giving himself Hexproof with this thing. Alright, Reclamation Sage. Am I going to regret not getting rid of that Panharmonicon? Maybe, but I think I do want to grab myself a Grum Gully. So we'll get down a basic. We want a couple of basics in for one of the dual lands to come in untapped, so get the basic down. And there is a lack of ramp, unfortunately, but might get into Mana Crypt here. Nope, it is a Sylvan Library. Uh, so maybe Sylvan Library and Rex Sage next turn. Get rid of the Panharmonicon. Scarab God throws out a Grimoire of the Dead. Can't activate it straight away, unfortunately. A Marileaf Pixie by the Volo player now. Not an ETB creature, at least. So copying the Marileaf Pixie, you assume that he'll copy the vast majority of creatures that he plays into the Commander. A Pillow Fort starting to form for the Pramacon. So I'll be intrigued to see how he wants to win in this game. Only has red mana from the Talisman, so it'd be tempting to blow that up, but... Getting down another Signet in Azorius Signet. So we'll assume he doesn't have a Swords or Swan Song or anything, because he could have held up some mana through all that. Held up a single mana, that is. Alright, another land, I'm assuming? No, Rishkar's Expertise I don't mind seeing. Uh, Alright. Now if we play the Reclamation Sage, it'll come in with a plus counter thanks to Grum Gully, which will put it over the threshold, so we'll draw a card with this. So let's go basic, and then we will blow up the Panharmonicon with the Reclamation Sage, it's too good not to. Alright, and there is a Peer Imaginative Rascal, so we're getting into some decent stuff here, just a little bit behind on mana compared to everyone else, but the more cards we draw, hopefully the more likely it is that we'll actually get into the ramp that we want, Sol Rings and Sky Shroud Claims and things like that. Anyway, there's no real decent attacks here. Can go in at the Scarab God, but then we don't have a blocker, so we'll hold back. 
and the Grimoire being activated there, and then the Lich Lord being activated as well to make a Zombie Wizard. Milled was a Vengeful Pharaoh, or discarded I should say. So, as the Unks would suggest, it is a Zombie Tribal list our opponent's gone after. Haha, <laughs> Junk Winder, that's a good one. So whenever a token enters under your control, tap an ally permanent and it is frozen for a turn cycle. And two of those is double the trouble. And funnily enough, this will trigger on itself because it is a token, so what are you going to freeze? you think tapping down the wall to get rid of the tail would be a good idea. Freezing this as well, maybe? And deciding to target the Grimoire. The third commander, Pramicon, making its way to the battlefield. And just passing it at that, so hopefully not holding up counter magic for us. A far seek, see what we get with the Sylvan Library, that will dictate what we do this turn, because I'm leaning towards the... Ravager Worm at the moment. I'm not sure it's worth the far seek then. Let's put that on top and we'll keep a forest. Definitely want to keep Return of the Wild Speaker as well, just in case the Rishkar's expertise is countered. So let's shuffle away the far seek that's on top and then let's go for this Ravager Worm, ready for casting the Rishkar's expertise next turn and we'll be able to get rid of this Volo as well before they can get too many tokens down into the Junk Winder. I don't think there's much sense in going for haste, really. It'll have a plus counter on it. We'll draw a card, and it can't swing into this anyway. It's all I'm worried about at the moment, so let's go plus counter from the um, Grum Gully. Uh, actually, from the Riot, it gets two plus counters on it. And then we'll fight a creature, and that is Volo, and hope that Volo doesn't scoop, thanks to losing two of his four drops. All right, and into a Hardened Scales. And yeah, we can only attack in at the right here, thanks to the Pramicon. So yeah, just past the turn. Lord of the Undead, that's a pet card of mine. It was way back when, when I played more paper. This was always really expensive, because it only ever had one printing. I'm not sure if it's ever been reprinted, weirdly. I think we've had a few zombie precon decks over the years, and yeah, I'm not sure that's ever been reprinted for some reason. don't think it's all that incredible now, but I was playing a really casual kitchen table. Uh, meta back then, so yeah, always fond memories of this thing. Don't think I ever got one in the end. <laughs> An unnatural growth here. So, uh, gonna have some big jump winders to deal with. Unfortunately, due to this Pramicon player, we're not gonna be able to hit them with a swing back. Makes them more aggressive in the red zone, potentially. Although, luckily for us, this player can only attack the Scarab God. So yeah, sending in a 10-12 over at the zombie player, kind of forcing him to chump block. Decided to hold back the original at least. I'm glad we've got Bane of Progress in this deck. Don't think I have a means of tutoring it out though. We'll just have to draw like hell until we get into it. Unfortunately, Sphere of Safety going down means our enchantments will as well, but I think it's worth it to destroy the Pillow Fort over here. We either need lots of mana to pay for this stuff, or we need to be uh, getting into removal for it. That is a Bring the End in. Counter a spell unless its owner pays two. Alright, not looking to put too much life into the Sylvan Library here, because we're about to draw a bunch with the Rishkar's Expertise. Not really worried about drawing cards with that, that we know are on top of our library. <laughs> There's the Far Seek again after the shuffle. Uh, so we'll put these two on top. I mean, it doesn't really matter what we put on top. We're about to draw them anyway. It does mean that we're likely going to have to, well, we are going to have to discard down to hand size this turn, but we can craft a decent hand, get further down into our library. So Rishkar's Expertise just played the Hardened Scales as well to give additional plus counters. Alright, and clearing a bunch of smaller stuff off the top. The first piece of ramp that we've seen is the Far Seek that seems very eager to be played. Um, and for some reason can play a 5 drop for free with Rishkar's Expertise. So we'll get down the Deep Forest Hermit, which is why I got the Hardened Scales into play first. So that actually comes in with two plus counters, making it a 3-3, thanks to Grum Gully and Hardened Scales, meaning we'll draw again. And the same will be true of the Squirrel Tokens that come in. So a tribute to the World Tree, doing some work for us here. Although, we're not struggling on card draw. Alright, so... Got a bunch of lands in hand now. I'm finally getting into a bit of ramp, I'm not sure what we want to discard, but... Yeah, we'll go straight through to the end of the turn, because we don't have enough... Toughness to deal with the Wall of Frost. Yeah, quite a difficult decision with regards to the discard there. Actually ended up having to get rid of the two ramp pieces after all that complaining about not getting into ramp. But yeah, we don't have too many sack outlets in the deck. There are some persist shenanigans in the deck, so 
having a, um, what is it called, a goblin bombardment or a spawning pit might be useful. We could go off with a um, persist creature and maybe combo off at some point. Here doubling up the plus counters could be handy as well so that we can start swinging into these big toughness creatures. And then obviously return of the wild speaker for more card draw at instant speed. Definitely want to keep hold of that. Could even use it as an overrun effect if we don't decide to go for it straight away. All relies on us really getting rid of that propaganda first though. Anyway during all that the Scarab God has snuck into play and now straight through to combat for the Cynic player can afford to get down his commander again. <laughs> Last March of the Ents. Draw cards equal to the greatest toughness amongst creatures you control. Well, a 12-12 will look pretty good there. Haven't seen a lot of Last March of the Ents ever since it was released. It's a really, really good one this. Anyway, got some free creatures into play. There is a Sludge Monster, Acidic Slime, Hornet Queen, and a Loyal Drake. Without token copies, thankfully. And personally, I would be putting the counter on the Pramicon from the Sludge Monster in order to have it lose abilities and then we can start swinging in over here but our opponent might be worried about us as well. Need to be able to attack freely ultimately. Oh really? The Sludge Monster going on to the Grum Gully so removes our ability there. Yeah, not sure about that. I mean it's not like we can attack him anyway. So now a bunch of insect tokens, four insect tokens coming down into two junk winders means that things can get frozen. Eight things are going to get frozen. So the first target is the Pramicon, then the Scarab God, Lord of the Undead, the Lord of Unks, a Squirrel Token, our Giant Worm, another Squirrel, seems though our opponent's just clicking random targets, yeah, another one of our Squirrels. I mean, surely you'd tap down the defenders here so that we can swing in over here? I mean, maybe they're worried about us getting rid of Pramicon and giving him the swing back, but he's got lots of blockers in place, so you'd think he'd try and help us get rid of this player? Get rid of any other player that isn't him, basically. Anyway, he's clearing the way to deal a lot of damage over here, thanks to these junk winders. So I've still got the Wall of Frost in the way, unfortunately, otherwise I would be swinging in over here and dealing some damage. Oh, that's actually during the second main phase, I forgot, so can't swing in over here, although these are frozen until his next turn, so we'll still be able to get in over there. Another prison effect is Windborne Muse creatures. Can't attack you unless they pay two for each one of them. Alright, the first vanishing counter is disappearing from the Hermit Druid. Have a few more turns with that thing yet. And then there's some more card draw available with the Silver Library. There is a Soul Ring I don't mind seeing. More card draw in the form of the Tributary Instructor as well. Um, do we care about Lightning Greaves? Thinking Mana Gorge a Hydra here. A Soul Ring Lightning Greaves protects it. And then we've still got three mana available for Pierce, so... Yeah, I suppose so. Put that on top and keep that. So play the Mana Gorgia Hydra first. And it will get two plus counters on it thanks to the Grum Gully not giving a plus counter and therefore the Hardened Scales not giving one either. So this going down does make a difference to us. Cinderglade comes in untapped thanks to playing those basics previously. That takes us into a Sol Ring. And Mana Gorgia puts plus counters on itself thankfully so two per spell now. And I suppose I didn't account for the land drop, so we can go Swift Up Boots instead of the Lightning Greaves, actually. Don't particularly mind having access to both, though. So we should go for Pier first. Should have gone for Pier before the Sol Ring, maybe. Because it does maximise the plus counters. And we are playing into a board wipe here, but we're in board wipe territory anyway. So uh, Pier coming down as a 1-1 as well. The Tribute to the World Tree will put plus counters on it. Uh, we will... Do we want to get rid of that card draw effect that's on top of our library? I don't think we do. I think we're best keeping that on top. Ready to maybe play next turn. So won't search for Toothy, which we wouldn't find in the deck anyway. Alright, so up here then getting four plus counters on it thanks to the additional counters effects. And we do want to be drawing as many cards as possible, like I said before, because if we can get into a persist combo, then it will be able to help take out the Volo player. So let's go Swiftfoot Boots onto the Mana Gorgia Hydra, which is now an 11-11. And there might be an Alpha Strike in the Pramicon's future, so we're going to have to make sure that we hold up mana. For the Mana Gorgia Hydra, it's going to be 4 to swing in with it at the moment. But yeah, as we can see here, can't attack either way there. Uh, how is this worded? Yeah, that can't attack the player, and that can't attack the player. So it's not worthy that we could for free go in at the Teo. That would entail going wide. Do we want to go wide? 
I think we're safe as long as this thing stays in play. And we're screwed if someone removes it, but... Yeah, let's try and go in at the Teo player. Alright, so it is a Squirrel token being blocked, which will freeze it for next turn, but hopefully everything else will untap. I mean, it assumes how much token shenanigans comes into these next turn. But we do successfully manage to take down the Walker, making sure this player doesn't have Hexproof, which can be relevant more often than you realise. Anyway, the Scar of God continuing to have us lose life and scry. Stitcher Duralf is not a zombie, a human wizard. It self mill and makes zombie tokens. Going to be a bit too slow for this game, I think. The Mana Gorger Hydra continuing to get multiple plus counters. Got three additional ones there, which will be true of all spells that are cast. It may well be that the Simic player has Cyclonic Rift or something like that and is able to just Alpha Strike a couple of us. We shall see what happens. Has a full grip in hand. Volo coming back into play. Well, that's more token production. A second harvest is going to freeze things again. And the best thing is, they're yeah, going to have an additional junk winder now as well. So it's three times as many effects on the tapping down shenanigans. So let's see here. All of the Demir creatures going to get frozen. And then it seems as though all of our creatures are getting targeted as well. I don't know if I covered it either. The Grimoire of the Dead has gone down. I think it must have been with the Acidic Slime that that got blown up. That's a turn or two ago now, so apologies for missing that. Alright, our opponent actually does target the Wall of Frost this time, so... Uh, Pramicon's been targeted. Um, okay, looks like the Wall of Frost has been targeted multiple times there, or is Magic Online goofing up? Uh, the Windborn Muse has been as well. Now, I'm not going to Alpha Strike the Pramicon player out of the way, because then we just set up the Simic player to Alpha Strike us. And then the Sludge Monster, where is that, can go on the stack as well. Is that it? Yeah, that can put another counter on something, removing its abilities. So they could do it on this and still attack us. Oh, actually, no, this is an attack ability, so they have to have declared attackers in order to trigger it, which they have done. Just had to go and run to the door and get a delivery, so I missed that. So they have attacked the player to the left, and this doesn't quite get them, I think, but nearly. I think they'll be left at two life points. And once they do get rid of this player, or if this player scoops, we'll be the one on the right anyway, so... <laughs> doesn't matter if we get rid of the Pramicon player or not, unless we want to get rid of this guy in combat, which I don't think we'll be able to. Okay, combat damage was dealt to this player, of course, so that triggers the Vengeful Pharaoh in the bin. So they were able to destroy a target attacking creature there. Oh, it was the Sludge Monster that they went after. So destroyed that, and the Vengeful Pharaoh went back into the library, which is an interesting little piece of tech. Okay, Dissipation Field. Our opponent's just setting up pillow forts over here, like I say, every single turn, but I'm not sure what his actual means of winning is. If we can keep this commander in play, it'll buy us a turn, ready to draw a bunch of cards with the return of the Wild Speaker, and hopefully get us into enough cards to combo off. Right, a Wall of Glare can block any number of creatures. Um, yeah, I got rid of the Renata previously, didn't I? Yeah, I got rid of Renata, unfortunately. Maybe should have kept that in hand, but I didn't know we were going to lose the Grum Gully. Still arguable that we shouldn't have lost Grum Gully when we could have had rid of Pramicon. But it may work out well for our opponents anyway, because if we get the Persist thing down, we need to also... Maybe Great Henge we can draw into to have the plus counter negate the minus counter. Anyway, a bunch of stuff not on tapping, thanks to... Our Simic friend over there. Alright, and just lands, so... What are we going to play this turn? Getting the sack outlet in play is probably a good idea. Then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Leaves us with 4 mana if we drop a land, so... That's Return of the Wild Speaker in this. For card draw. So, yeah, get rid of Demolition Field. Or actually play Demolition Field over the Rootbound Crag. And we will pay 4 life, because... <laughs> we're losing to a massive army anyway if we're not careful. So play Demo Field. Play the Spawning Pit. Might be an idea to play the Lightning Greaves as double protection on the Mana Gorger Hydra, but yeah, I'll just risk keeping that thing in play. So double check the man here. Four, and then one, two, three, four, five for the Return of the Wild Speaker. We'll hope that we dodge counter magic with that. But yeah, this is a new one that will protect against board wipes, hopefully. Draw a card for each creature with a plus counter on it that dies, which is... All of our creatures at the moment. Oh, of course, the Sludge Monster's gone down, so we do actually have the Grumgully back. I was just wondering how we got plus counters on the Merfolk, but 
Yeah, of course, the abilities have come back for Grum Gully, so no need to worry about the whole persist thing anymore. Um, we should be online for it with a sack outlet. Drew into the rootbound crag thanks to the tribute to the world tree and the merfolk entering. Uh, unnatural growth isn't relevant to us as long as Pramacon's in play. Just praying people don't scoop and warp the outcome of the game at this point. Because as soon as the Demir player scoops, he's going to totally screw us here. We've got 63 cards in the deck and we stand to draw even more with Mana Gorgia Hydra and a return of the Wildspeaker. The Scarab God might be hoping to scry a board wipe onto the top. Alright, what have we got here? Uh, that is a Grey Merchant of Asphodel, alright, he's not going to gain enough life with that. Uh, that'll be 2, 4, 5 and 6, so 6, 12, 18. But it's still a massive hit coming at him from over here. So he does jump back up to 20, we go down to 16. Then goes through to combat. Alright, and Scarab God playing it out honourably and deciding to take the hit here by the looks of it. Again, it might be that the Simic player can get rid of the Pramicon and go into the red zone however he chooses, but we will see here. Eight cards in hand. Alright, and we've managed to get Volo into his combat phase. So, uh, draws a card with the Loyal Drake at the beginning of combat. Having two of those in play will be good. Okay, so trying to go wide in with the uh, three 10 12 junk winders, which have dominated this game. And do manage to get rid of that player. Very much appreciate the Scarab God playing it out there. It does make a difference. And very much used to players on Magic Online scooping early and warping games. Still have to dodge counter magic yet, and I know that my opponent is playing counter magic, so... Yeah, probably not destined to do much of anything, but we can try. Okay, we want to be drawing with Return of the Wild Speaker, preferably, because there's way more cards to be drawn. But, might not be able to get it through counter magic. We'll try it though, and force our opponent to use it, assuming he has any. And failing that, we can draw some additional cards with the Spawning Pit and sacrificing some plus counter creatures. Uh, Mana Gorgia Hydra will get even bigger. It is now a 38-38. And we'll draw us 38 cards if our opponent doesn't do anything about this. If he doesn't, we'll assume he doesn't have counter magic, I suppose. Green does have a means of keeping things from being countered, so... Probably best to not allow this. And he does allow it. So let's see here. We have the Gaia's Cradle, which will come in handy if we're desperate. There's the Wheel of Fortune as well. And that's what we wanted. Couldn't remember what it was called before. A Woodfall Primus will destroy all the non-creature permanents, basically. So, don't know if it necessarily saves us. But we can maybe hold up Beast Within or go for the Chain Reaction as well. We shall see. And the Deep Forest Hermit goes down to Vanishing. So we got the Instructor in just in time. That will draw us another card. 24 left in the library before we've hit the draw phase. Got another sack outlet in Goblin Bombardment, which is noteworthy, so... So maybe get that down with the Woodfall Primus, is infinite damage. As long as we've got targets for it, that is. Uh, Alright, Fast Mana will be handy as well, so... Uh, put you on top, put you on top, basic. And we've drawn into uh, Inspiring Call as well, to draw even more. Uh, so if we go for a board wipe, we can make our board indestructible. So, not terrible draws off the Sylvan Library. It was still relevant, even though we drew a bunch. Uh, Reliquary Tower is an unlimited hand size, but we definitely want... Trying really hard not to misclick. The Gaia's Cradle here. So, play out the Mana Crypt. And maybe we go for the Indestructible with this. How many cards are we going to draw? 23 left, so 2, 4... Or 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, so we'll have enough left. Our stuff does gain indestructible, which is good. All our things gain indestructible, apart from the commander, which is noteworthy. So, do we just go for the Woodfall Primus now? I think we're fine doing it now. And then we draw to tribute to the World Tree. Oh, that's an issue, actually. We're gonna... <laughs> we're gonna draw to tribute to the World Tree every time we... Try and go for a combo here, aren't we? Um, and that will deck us, unfortunately. But we do have a Nature's Claim in our hand. If my memory serves me. Yeah, so let's go Nature's Claim onto the Tribute to the World Tree. That will destroy it and gain us 4 life as well. Alright, so now we're not going to cantrip every time the Woodfall Primus enters. Managed to blow up an island. Draw a card with the Tribute. Oh, damn it, and I've actually... <laughs> the, the game's lagging out like crazy of all the cards. I've accidentally just played out the Great Henge. 
Oh, Jesus. Right, so we're going to have to blow a beast within now as well, I think. I'm trying to click the arrows and I've accidentally clicked on the Great Henge somehow. So as soon as we get rid of Tribute to the World Tree, I immediately replace it with a Great Henge. So I might as well tap that for mana, gain a little bit of life. So yeah, a bit more mana wasted. We'll go Beast Within onto the Great Henge. Alright, and that successfully gets blown up luckily. So we do get a Beast token into play, which comes in as a 6-6. Six, six. Not going to be relevant, I don't think. Uh, right, very carefully click round here. We want to hold up mana for the Blasphemous Act and the Chain Reaction. Um... Blasphemous Act's only going to cost one, Chain Reaction will cost four, so let's go Goblin Bombardment here, so that we can better get rid of the Simic player, hopefully. And do we just get those Lightning Greaves into play now? Then we can protect the Grum Gully, or try to. So we're definitely casting the uh, Lightning Greaves here. On Magic Online, I mean, this does mean that we can still have the Chain Reaction countered, unfortunately, so maybe not a good idea, but... I do want to try and combo off here. I think it's our only means of winning. So I'll try and protect the Grum Gully with the Lightning Greaves. We haven't wasted the mana on the Great Henge. We'd still be able to keep up both board wipes, but here we are. Uh, okay, so Goblin Bombardment pointed at our opponent. Sacrifice the Wooded Foothills. Oh my god, I forgot about the Instructor as well. Too many Nombos in this deck. <laughs> anyway, what happens is the Woodfall Primus comes back with a minus one, minus one counter on it. And the minus one, minus one counter is negated by all the plus counters. So it will always come back. And when it comes back, we blow up a non-land permanent. Um, luckily, we can destroy this thing or sacrifice this thing with a goblin bombardment. So we'll do that now. Sacrifice the merfolk so we don't do even more cantrip shenanigans and end up decking ourselves. So just going after the blue mana, first of all. It bodes well that the Simic player isn't floating blue mana. But we'll keep doing this, sacrificing the... Woodfall Primus shenanigans and keep blowing up the islands. We'll go after all the lands in play, I think. It's turn 10, so I think we're fine to be doing that at this point. Might be that there's still free counter magic over here, so we're not out of the woods yet. There aren't enough non land permanents to target with the Woodfall Primus in order for Goblin Bombardment to deal enough damage, unfortunately. But maybe we can sacrifice enough creatures to um, deal the last points of lethal damage. Alright, so cleared the lands and the enchantment here. We'll go after the Jeskai player now as well and see if he wants to interfere in any way. Still going to be pointing the damage over here though. Alright, and the Jeskai player decided to scoop as soon as we start going after his lands. So we are now hopefully free to dodge counter magic. Oh, that actually means that we have to target our own stuff, which is annoying. So uh, just go after the mana crypt. We are done next turn anyway, most likely, if we don't win here. So let's attempt to speed things up here and we'll go for the Blasphemous Act. Uh, where is it? So that we can just turn in sideways for lethal, hopefully. All our stuff is indestructible, don't forget, or most of it. Alright, there we go, and by turn 10, managing to absolutely wipe the Simic player's board, including those pesky junk winders. So yeah, a little bit clunky towards the end there. Made the odd misclick, which could have cost us the game. Luckily, we did manage to get into the guy's cradle, so we had a surplus of mana. Not sure we would have been able to do this without that card. Alright, and uh, yeah, the Simic player has lost connection to the game here, so we're not going to be able to swing in for lethal, but that would be the end of the game anyway, so hopefully you all enjoyed this revisit to Grum Gully, who I accidentally put in the graveyard, I've just realised. A very happy Christmas to you all, and for those of you who do not celebrate Christmas, then happy Monday, and I will see you all in the next one, I hope. I'm Tribal Kai. Thank you for watching.